Heavenly Father, guide us through your Holy Spirit as we look at the longest time prophecy in your Holy Word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. A universal court summons. Or we talk about the 2000. 300 year prophecy. Let me take my next. Two thousand three hundred day prophecy or years. The Bible longest time prophecy. And we're told, Revelation 14, 7, we go around the world, we preach, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So the key factors of the heavenly judgment are that it takes place in heaven. Focus before the establishment of God's kingdom. It deals with the judgment of, of a false religious system, implying the restoration of truth before God establishes his kingdom on earth. It's all sequential. This restoration will involve the truth trampled down by the little horn, such as the Sabbath, people keep Sunday as a day of rest, salvation by faith, not by work, and also the Ten Commandments, all ten of them, not nine out of ten. Christ is actively participating in the heavenly judgment before he returns to earth to establish his everlasting kingdom. Now, on Wednesday night, we look at the three phases of the judgment. We look at the 1,000-year period based on Revelation chapter 20 called the review judgment. As you are saved, you are in heaven, you find out that Pastor Boldo is not there. God forbid, God say, come and see. Pastor Boldo wasn't faithful. So God is transparent. Then there is the executive judgment, the third and final phase, when the holy city comes down from heaven after the 1,000 year, then fire will consume the wicked. And by the way, Ezekiel called this God a strange act because God never meant to kill or to burn the wicked. That's a strange act. Why should you die, you say? I'm opening your life today. Take all of it. So tonight we look at the pre-advent judgment. So we go around the world preaching the gospel. Then I look and behold a white cloud. And on the clouds sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and also in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Stress in your sickle and reap why, for the harvest of the world is ready. A lot of activities taking place in heaven, a flurry of activities, Angels flying around the world, preaching the gospel. So he who sat on the cloud, stretched in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was grieved. And behold, I'm coming quickly, Revelation 22 to 12, and my reward is with me to give to every according to his word. So this is why we believe there is a pre-advent judgment. If there was no judgment going on in heaven now, I can Christ come and give you a reward. So the reward explained that the judgment has taken place. What is the significance of this judgment? Paul served this universal court summons. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each may receive according to what he has done. Each one of us has a case pending. And now Luke wrote in the book of Acts that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. 
If it's in the Bible, we buy it. If it's not in the Bible, we reject it. So this is a big crowd of mankind. Whether you are a rich or poor person, you are judgment bound. Whether you have a Cadillac or an old banker, you are judgment bound. Whether you are black, white, or yellow, you are judgment bound. We must all appear in front of God's tribunal. The twin books of prophecy, Daniel and Revelation. Fear God and give glory to him for his the hour of his judgment has come. And this hour of the judgment is locked in the book of Daniel. We'll find it in a minute. But you, Daniel, shut up the word and seal the book until the time of the end. Knowledge will increase. Biblical knowledge will increase. And technological knowledge will build to that already. Where does the final judgment take place? This is the question. Daniel 7.10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, God. A thousand and thousand ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before God. The court was seated and the book were opened. This is a judgment scenario taking place. Where? Daniel 7 tells you where and Daniel chapter 8 tells you when. It's very methodical the way God inspired the prophet and the Bible uh, writers to pen down the messages from him. And he said to me, now, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. First of all, what is the cleansing of the sanctuary? The high priest goes there. We say that justice and mercy have kissed each other. This is the mercy seat. The mercy seat has got the Ten Commandments in it. The ark has got the Ten Commandments in it. And the top of the ark is the mercy seat. And the high priest once a year in the Hebrew economy went into the most holy place in the temple and there he confessed the sin of the people. And that was called the Day of Atonement. If you look at the word atonement, means at one man. You've been separated from God through sin throughout the whole year. Now the day of atonement is therefore heralded by the trumpets. Whenever something important took place in Israel, the people sounded the sofar, the trumpet, so that the people could come round and prepare themselves. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you from your sin, that you may be clean from all the sins before the Lord. So you come in the court of the sanctuary every day. The sinner comes with a lamb, and the, the throat is slit, and the blood is poured out on the altar of incense there, the, the burn the thing, and then the blood is there. And before you do that, the priest in the lava is washing his hands for cleanliness, and then he does a sacrifice. And then we find that the blood is taken on the, in the holy place in front of the altar. The cleansing of the sanctuary was a day of judgment for Israel, symbolizing for us today the final judgment. You see how it goes. When would this cleansing of the sanctuary or final judgment begin? We know there is a judgment, but when does it start? So we repeat again what was given to Daniel 8, 14, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, Daniel is going to be bombarded with vision, and he cannot stomach it, so Gabriel is dispatched from heaven, and he says, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Did you get that? Because the Hebrew economy, the Hebrew temple, the Hebrew sanctuary was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. And now it tells you point blank. This refers to the end. And we said before that the book of Daniel is very unique in that it really focuses our mind on the end time scenario. The vision, end time, heavenly sanctuary, not earthly sanctuary. Symbolic time period. If you apply 2,700 days literally, you don't move from ancient history at all. So there is a key in prophetic interpretation. 
And the Bible tells us, Ezekiel 46, I have appointed thee each day for a year. In prophetic jargon, there is this yardstick that we've got to use. The Numbers 1434, each day for a year. So when you talk about apocalyptic development, end time situation, a day is equal to a year. Not all the time, but here in this context it is. So in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. So 2,300 prophetic days is equal to 2,300 literal years. So we find that this period of 2,300 years is going to be broken down. 69 weeks is seven days per week. Give you 483 prophetic days or 483 literal years. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for many days. He couldn't stomach it. He fainted. And he says, I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Daniel failed to understand the vision. Later, Gabriel descended to explain it. While I was speaking in prayer, the angel Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning, informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, he was a man of prayer. He prayed three times a day. And now Gabriel comes back. He fainted. Gabriel departed. Now Gabriel, the angel of God, comes back and says, Play it back on the screen of your mind. Stop. This is where you, you fainted. I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. And as we study this, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8 together, you are going to be instructed not by me, but the Holy Spirit will make it clear to your mind. Most amazing prophecy led thousands skeptics to become Christians. Historic events from Daniel's day to the first coming and the second coming of Christ. When do these 2,300 years begin and end? We're talking about a period, but it's dangling about in midair, so now we've got to establish. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Daniel was a Jew, your people, the Jewish people. I've been given 70 weeks. So 70 weeks, you multiply it by 7, will give you 490. Yes, determined, cut off. Daniel's people, the Jews, are being allocated a period of 490 years to sort themselves out. Because the Jews thought they were it. They were the custodian of God's truth. They missed out that God so loved the world. And there are some Adventists today, I say it kindly, because we know the truth, we think we are it. Just go on. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people, that's 490 years. So 2,600 day prophecy or 2,600 year prophecy, we've got the first part, 490 years allocated to the Jews, then 18, 10 years, last part of the prophecy, for the Gentile. This is why Paul was converted. We'll come to that later. So, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, he breaks the 490 years into 483 years. There will be a decree given by some king for you Hebrew people to go back home and finish rebuilding your city and your temple. So here they were on the march. The 70 weeks prophecy was to take us eventually, the 69 weeks prophecy, 483 years, was to take us to Messiah. The street will be built again and the wall, even in trouble sometimes, people were having some problem because some people were jealous. They were trying to stop the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, to regain their commonwealth. But eventually, God had decreed, and Ezra said, this is the way forward. So the 70-week prophecy of Jesus come to Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One. So according to the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verse 13, the decree to resolve, to restore and Rebuild Jerusalem was issued 
in 457 BC. You see, I've said before, I'll repeat it. Prophecy is history in advance. So, this is the decree was mentioned to Daniel that Ezra confirmed that the building started in rebuilding in 457 BC. So now we've got a starting point. 457 BC. When you add 40, 483 years to that, you go forward, you will come to Messiah. Who's the Messiah? I don't know. Let the Bible tell me. In AD 27, what happened in AD 27? Huh? That word that you know which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John the Baptist was preaching. There you go. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now the word anointed means Messiah. When was Christ anointed or baptized? When did Christ become the Messiah? Not at his birth. No, he was still too close to take on his ministry. Now, when was Christ baptized? So you go back to the history book, to the local library. It says, Luke picks it up in 3, 121. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when all people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the dove came and rested on him. Now, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign was A.D. 27. Can you do that? Because Dr. Luke, Apostle Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, he was meticulous for dates and such milestones. So A.D. 27 was the, the, the Caesar's Augustus and Tiberius, and Christ came and was baptized on time. And the Holy Spirit descended bodily form upon him, and a voice was heard from heaven, You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The triune God was present. Christ, the Messiah, is anointed by the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit like a dove. Then God pronounces throughout the orbs of the universe, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And Christ was to launch out in his ministry to save sinners. Now, when Christ started his ministry, that's very, very important. Mark 1.15, he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What time is fulfilled? Christ, as he started the ministry, appealed to the time element of the book of Daniel as patent proof that I am the Messiah. As determined by the prophet Daniel. And after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Let's move on. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. One week is seven days, seven year period. But in the middle of the week, three and a half year, he shall begin and end. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. What is he talking about? Let's look. So Christ is baptized in AD 27. There is one prophetic week left, which is seven years. Three and a half years. He says Messiah was to be cut off. What do you mean by that? AD 31, Christ was crucified in the middle of the week. Yes? put a stone, a crown of stone on his head. Simon the Cyrenian was to help him with his cross. Seventy week prophecy of Jesus the Messiah. That's left. Something is left is 3.5 years is left. This is why this prophecy of Daniel chapter 8 and especially chapter 9 
rabbi years ago placed a curse on that prophecy. He said, curse is the finger of the hand of the man and may he soak the eyes burn out in their socket who try to understand the time element of the book of Daniel. Because the rabbi jolly well knew that any Jew who come to this prophecy have got to acknowledge that Christ did come on time. Whereas today, sad to say, the Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come for the first time. Because they wanted somebody to come to defeat the Roman oppressors and to set the Jewish people free. But Christ never came to fight wars. He came to fight the sin problem. And he came to set people free from sin. So, he said, in the midst of the week, Christ the Messiah would call the sacrifice to cease. And how did this happen? After three and a half years. There you go. Mark 15, 38. Then the veil of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. And Joseph would tell us that this veil was something like four inches thick. On top of that, it was torn from the bottom, but from the top, an unseen hand. And as the priest was there, the knife flew out of his hand, and also the lamb just disappeared. Why? Because Christ, the lamb of the world, had just died at three o'clock, the time of the evening sacrifice. Spot on. A dramatic change took place in the Hebrew economy and sacrificial system. As far as heaven was concerned, the value of sacrifice and oblation was to cease forever. This is why Christ said, it is finished when he gave up the ghost on the tree of Calvary. No more sacrifices. This is why before he proceeded to Calvary, the Jews were so full of themselves and they missed out completely on the plan of salvation. So Matthew 23, verse 18, Before your house is left unto you desolate. Christ said, I am the living temple. You rejected me. You are going to crucify, crucify me. So your house will be left unto you desolate. So these verses predict that the Messiah would die by crucifixion on the 14th day of the first Jewish month in the year A.D. 31. So according to the prophecies of Daniel, God's covenant with the Jews would cease in A.D. 34. What am I talking about? Four seventy years allocated to you, Jewish people. What's happening? Stephen was a man full of the Holy Spirit. He was a deacon. He was dragged by Paul in front of the Jewish parliament, the Sanhedrin, made up of 70 members of parliament. And these guys were very, very rigid. And as Stephen is there, he never lost his qualm. He said, exactly what your forefathers have done, you killed and persecuted the prophet, and you've done the same thing to Christ. He went for them under the power of the Holy Spirit. Then as he said that, they rushed him out, gnashing at their teeth, put him in a hollow, and they started to stone him to death. They rejected Christ. Three and a half years are located to them. They stoned God's disciples to death. The Jewish people as a nation have reached the point of no return. Today the Jew can be saved individually. They are no more the, 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 the special people. And who was the ringleader? Saul. He was called Saul then. He had mandate and warrant from the high priest to go and arrest the Christian because he thought that the Christian were detrimental to the commonwealth of Israel. So Stephen, the first Christian martyr, 
Jewish leaders rejected the gospel, gospel from then on right to the Gentiles. So this is what's happening. 490 years to AD 34. You've got 1810 years left. 1810 plus AD 34 brings you to 1844. And this is the beginning after 2,300 years from AD BC 457 to AD 1844 is your 2,300 year prophecy. Judgment began where? In heaven. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Which sanctuary? The heavenly sanctuary. On the earthly sanctuary, the sins of the people were confessed every day. Then on the day of Yom Kippur, in the Jewish calendar, in October, they go in there, the high priest confesses his own sin. If the high priest never confessed his sin, he went to the most holy place, he was struck dead. So, seven aspects highlighted in Daniel 9.24 about Christ's ministry. To finish transgression. To make an end of sin offering. To make reconciliation for iniquity, for sin. To bring back everlasting righteousness. If you confess, then you become righteous. It's given to you by him. To set the seal upon the vision. This is it now, 1844. Something tremendous is going to happen in the annual of the final judgment in God's plan. To seal up the prophecy to anoint the most holy place. Since the year 1844, we have been living in what the Bible calls God's judgment hour. Let's review it. So, 2,300 days, 4 by 7, it's a year, 70 weeks, 490 years are located to the, to the Jewish people, then AD 34, they, AD 34, they, 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 they kill Stephen, then at the same time, Paul is converted and he brings the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, when Paul was going on the way to Damascus with a warrant to stop and to persecute and to drag Christians in prison, a light at the noon of day, strong light, blinded him and he went boom on the floor. Then a voice spoke to him. The guards and all these guys are accompanying Paul. Never heard the voice. Only Paul heard the voice. And the voice said to him point blank, Why does thou persecute me? Why do you persecute me? Jesus was now having a dialogue one to one with Paul. Then Paul said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Christ, who you are persecuting. You know, God could see the potential in Paul. And then Christ said to him, it will be hard for you to kick against the priest. Since you stoned Stephen to death, your conscience has been pricking you. Now you got to turn around because I want to use you. He was blind. And then the disciples were asked to go and pray with him, and he restored his sight. So the first 490 years, or this 2,600 years, have to do with the Jews. The last part of the 2,600 years have to do with God's people today. So gospel to the Gentile, Paul sort of launched it out. So then, God's time and even we can see the first coming of Christ by the crib of Bethlehem, with an event we cannot see the second coming. And if the event came true during the first part of the prophecy, it is a divine imperative that the event will come true also during the second part of this prophecy. So the first part, then you come to 1844, and I put it back together on this map here, on this chart. 457 BC, 2300 years, and you've got 490 years allocated to the Jewish nation. The Messiah come, baptism. And seven years left, Jewish nation rejected as God's agent. Three and a half years. And what happened in the middle of the, all this seven-year period? The cross is planted on the brow of Calvary for you and for me and for whosoever believes. 18, 10 years left. 
plus AD 34 give you a 1844 sanctuary claims we call it the investigative judgment in heaven. So it all adds up. We prove arithmetically, we prove biblically, we prove historically, we prove prophetically that these days are fixed and they are here to stay. Try to interject any explanation to destroy the 2,200 day theology. God is a white God. So that we know where we are. So since 1844, we have been living in what we call the judgment hour. In earth's final hour, God invites men and women, boys and girls, to come to him. We are living in the judgment hour. Now you say, wait a minute, you Adventist preacher about your judgment, you frightening people. No, don't be frightened. Because your lawyer is whom? Christ. The true and faithful witness is whom? Christ. Your elder brother is whom? Christ. So if any judgment in session was heavily swung in favor of the accused, it's the one going up in heaven. He wants to save you, not to judge you. So keep clean. Since 1844, God has been restoring the truth that were only save through Jesus. The truth that whatever heartache and sorrow we go through, we need, not, need more than an earthly priest, but a heavenly high priest who is Jesus Christ. And I say it very kindly now. This is why you cannot pray to Pastor Bodo. You cannot pray to the priest. You cannot pray to Pope Francis. Why don't you do that? You displace Christ in the heavenly sanctuary as your high priest. However well intended the priest can be out there. Since 1844, God has been restoring the truth that if we love him, we will allow him to change our heart and write his law in our heart and in our mind. Since 1844, it's no more common time. It's no more pleasures as usual. It's no more business as usual. When we talk about why so many churches will go through that, how the Bible you restore the great reformers, and then you come to the remnant church, the seminary Sabbath is restored, a movement of destiny. God has always got a messenger with a message. God raised a messenger, Ellen G. White. She received her first vision in December 1844 at the age of 17. Don't ask me why. And the Adventist church is organized. We take the good news around the world. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness to the world. And then the end will come. So today the SDA church is going global. We are working in more than 202 countries of 228 countries recognized by the United Nations. So this is why I say it kindly. I say it humbly. This is why the only church on the face of this planet right now preaching this, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, is the SDA church. And time is running out on the human race as it ran out during the time of Noah. That's an ensemble for us. If we for 120 years, we said that the other night, and nobody came, but they pulled joke at him until the ark was sealed and then the flood came. And time is running out on the human race. Even people who don't believe in the Bible, when they see what's happening in the world right now, they say, wow. The book of the Hebrews, I'm going to close now. Let Paul writing to the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, were totally set apart. They were totally surprised. Look, we're inventing for the Messiah. And if he was the Messiah, he was crucified, he's gone, so we are nowhere. So Paul now writes to the Hebrew people, the book of Hebrews. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands by Moses, which are copies of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God 
Have you got it? What we've been talking about, Daniel chapter 8 and 9, now is confirmed in the New Testament by Paul. Christ, the true high priest, is in the heavenly sanctuary. So here you go. This is the earthly sanctuary. It's completely kaput and it's replaced by the heavenly sanctuary. Christ goes back, AD 31, 1844, and now the Christian era, we don't know when the time will end, but it's not far for Christ to come. And then Paul drives home the point again. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens above. So the sanctuary which is being cleansed now is heavenly sanctuary. Why? Because every day you confess your sins to Christ. Christ applied his blood just like the high priest applied the blood in the most holy place once a year. Christ ever leaves us to make intercession for us. That's beautiful. Beautiful. A minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched or erected and not man. So it's not the Moses sanctuary anymore now. It's the true, the, the real one in heaven. But Christ being come as an high priest by his own blood he entered in once in the morning place. Hey, Christ added finality to the sacrificial system and to the judgment scenario. The high priest had to confess his sin, whereas Christ has got no sin to confess. He is spotless. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. Look here, ladies and gentlemen, if you miss out on the plan of redemption, you got yourself to blame. It's offered to you tonight on a plate as obtained eternal redemption for a whosoever believes. For Christ is not entered, he labels the point now, for Christ is not entered into the holy place self made with hand, which are the figures of the true, the image, the shadow, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And you have any doubt? Hebrews 7.25, let's say it together. Huh? He is able also to say to the animals, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Wow. I don't give two hoots how bad you are. If you confess your sin, Christ picks it up. He applies his blood. He says, Father, my blood. What a transaction. No priest can do that. It's a direct heart to heart. This is why in Revelation chapter 5 he says, a door of access. A door is open in heaven. What door? Christ is a door of access. Therefore, Christ, before he took off, he says, therefore, whoever confesses me before man, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Hmm. You don't have to stand alone in the judgment because Christ is with you. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You know, there is no ism in the world that could fabricate something like the plan of salvation. We defaulted. We sold everything. God displaced Christ from heaven. And he comes down in Bethlehem and his ministry begins. They nail him on the cross because the wages of sin is death. Okay, let's go with me to London, the Royal Mint in the city of London. This is where they print all your money. Huh? Nicole, all that money in your wallet. <laughs> Pound note. So what happened there? The guy takes the tourists around. There are about two million tourists every year, you know. And this is the scale. That scale is spot on. Minute little thing could make it tip. So what does the guy do? He takes two blank pieces of paper, same size, same weight, same thickness, put one in each scale. 
and he takes his pen, he signs his name on all of the piece of paper, and he put it back in the scale. You know what happened? The scale took. One signature on this scale will tip the scale. And tonight, Christ signs his name against you, 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 and me. And tip in our favor. So, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But there is a but. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sin, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is why I say Christ so loved the world, God so loved the world. But the world got to acknowledge him. If we don't climb down and accept him as our savior, one thing God will never ever do is to force, force salvation on anybody. Yes? This is why Acts 4, 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. As we live in the most critical time of redemption history, have we made our peace with God and with men? Have we? I want you to meditate on that. Now, tomorrow morning, we are going to look at Revelation sign of allegiance in Earth's last conflict. Don't miss tomorrow morning. We start at 11, but there is Bible study at half past nine. Then tomorrow afternoon, we're going to look at Islam in Bible prophecy. What's happening out there with the jihadists is all in the Bible. And you ought to know that you know where you belong, to whom do you belong. There is nothing which escapes the ken of God. So bring some friends around and let's try to get comfort from the more sure word of prophecy.